to worship you together through song, God. Lord, we worship your great name this morning, God. And Lord, just pray, pray a blessing over the uh, the rest of the service, God. And um, and uh, let us let our ears be open to hear, our hearts open to receive your word this morning, God. We thank you, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Church, let's be seated. Last week, we finished up a series on idolatry. We're starting a new series this week called Who is God? Here it is. And um, next couple weeks, specifically the next four weeks, we're going to be walking through uh, a series discussing what is God like? What's he like? Um, when I was little, uh, my dad read uh, the Chronicles of Narnia to me and my twin brother. It was really cool. We had gone to the Secret Santa shop at our at our uh, school. Did anyone, did y'all have Secret Santa at y'all's elementary schools? Yeah, your parents gave you a little money and you went and bought gifts for them. Um, yeah, so we got these little rings. I don't know if you read The Magician's Nephew, but they're able to go to Narnia with these rings they put on. And so we had these little crystal boxes with these rings. And every night we'd go into my dad's bedroom, we'd get our crystal boxes, and we'd put our rings on and we'd go to Narnia. And we would read the books, and we read through the whole series, and um, there's one scene uh, where we've got a, a fox talking to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and this fox has seen someone called Aslan. Uh, if you're not familiar with the series, Aslan is, is the God figure. He represents God throughout the whole narrative, and uh, the text says this, Mr. Fox is one of the few animals that had gotten to speak with Aslan. Mr. Beaver was very surprised when he heard that he had gotten to see Aslan, and Miss Beaver asked, what's he like? Mr. Fox answered, like everything we have ever heard. Hmm. What's he like? That's the question that you and I are going to be asking over the next four weeks when it comes to God. What is God like? Who is God? If I ask you to describe maybe your, let's say, your in-laws, what are they like? You might list a number of attributes, nice, wonderful, kind. Maybe others would list other adjectives, um, sanctifying, <laughs> opportunity for growth. I don't know. Um, but we, you would probably describe them by their attributes, what they're like. In the same way, the Bible describes God using a variety of attributes. It says God is wise. He's, he's wisdom, justice, and grace, and mercy. He's omnipotent and omniscient. He's sovereign. He's so many things. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be walking through a number of them. And my goal is to increase your worship of God as you see him in, in more high definition, right, if you will, right? I'm trying to take you from 720p to 4K. I mean, everyone in this room would agree God is sovereign. But my goal is to move us deeper into an understanding of what that means. Not just so that you can understand, but that so you can appropriate that truth for your life. What good is it if you believe God is sovereign if you don't really know what it means on Monday morning? It's just a theological truth. I want to help you appropriate that truth in your life. Why does that matter and what does it mean God is sovereign? To what degree is God, is sovereign? Is God sovereign? Questions like this. And so that's the task before us, super excited about this, and today we're going to start out with two attributes, both of which are mentioned in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, I'll read it to you. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the, here it is, almighty reigns. The Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. So the Lord is almighty. That means he has all might. And what does he do with that might? 
reigns. He reigns. So we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about what that means. What does it mean that he's almighty? What does it mean that God is sovereign? Omnipotence and sovereignty today. And so one word that theologians have used to describe the fact that God is almighty is the one I just mentioned, that is omnipotence. Now, the word omnipotence is not in your Bible. Don't look for it because you won't find it. It is a word that we've used to describe something that's all over the Bible. Yeah, we do this all the time. The word incarnation, missionary, the fall, none of those things are in your Bible. But they are concepts and words that we use to describe things that are in the Bible. And omnipotence is one of them. So, Actually, defining omnipotence can be a little bit tricky. You know, some people think, well, can God make a breakfast so big that he can't eat it? You know, things like this. There's some philosophical difficulties here, so I'm not going to get into all of that. But for our purposes, and this is where we're going to start, we'll, we'll fill it out. But omnipotence means that God has the power to do anything he wants to do. God can do anything that he wants to do. We get that from verses like Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Job 42, verse 2. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So simply put, just at the very beginning of our discussion today, there has never been something that God has wanted to do that he's been unable to do for lack of ability or resources or strength. Never. He has always been able to accomplish anything he wants. He has never failed. And he never will, because he's all-powerful. Again, we're going to fill this definition in. There's, there's a lot more to say. This is a very basic definition, but it's where we're going to start. Um, and so, uh, you know, being a dad, I've, sometimes I sit in my living room and I listen to the risers sing their kids' praise, and, and, I, and me and Rebecca look at each other and we go, how did it come to this? You know, how did we get here? <laughs> right? We're singing like 2 Peter 3.18, 2 Peter 3.8. We're like singing all the songs. And one of the songs, I'm like, man, life has changed. Um, and one of, the, one of the songs that Pierce listens to, uh, it says something that you and I have heard probably growing up. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Thank you for the participation. There's nothing my God cannot do. And I'm very happy for Pierce to listen to that song because I don't require that level of theological precision in a nine-month-old. But I, I, wanna, I want you to note that that's not how we've defined omnipotence right? There's nothing my God cannot do because the reality is there are quite a few things that God is unable to do. Uh, God is unable to lie. He cannot lie. He can't go against his character. He can't sin. Um, God can't make himself cease to exist, for example. God cannot create another God stronger than himself, okay? Um, all of those things would be bad. We don't want those things. So in this sense, God is unable to do anything bad, which in its own way is kind of a strength, God can only do that which is good and excellent and wonderful. And that strength is on display from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And I want to give you a little survey of that strength, of that power. I want to give you four pictures of God's omnipotence. And I want to say this is a little bit different than normal. Usually we're in a text and we're walking through it. This series will be a little bit different. Our next series, our Advent series, we're going to be walking through the book of Ruth verse by verse, okay? So that's our normal diet around here. It's kind of walking through a text. This is a little bit different today. I'm going to give you um, just little snapshots and pictures of God's power and God's sovereignty to help you worship. And just a warning at the outset, we've got some real varsity note takers in this church. Let me just say, I mean, true varsity note takers, and you're going to be frustrated if you try, Ben, you're a varsity note taker, your wife just smoothed you out. Um, we're gonna, they're going to be frustrated trying to get all these. we got a ton of verse references. I felt bad for Mary having to put all these in. There are a ton of verse references, a ton of quotations. You'll go crazy if you try to write them all down. So what I'd rather you do is listen and get the sense of what we're talking about, be imp have it be impressed upon you. And we upload this manuscript to the website. You can look at all the references and all the quotes later. But I'd hate for you to miss the, the, um, the weight of what we're talking about because you're trying to record what we're talking about. Okay, so just a little heads up. We're going to go kind of secret church style. If you've been to a secret church, David Platt talks about 1,000 miles an hour and everyone struggles to keep up. I'm not going to go that fast, but just a heads up in advance. So that's where we're heading this morning. I want to pray for myself. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to jump into God's omnipotence and God's sovereignty. So let's pray together. God, thank you for bringing us together in this room. 
we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus, and we're grateful that the same power that raised him from the dead lives in us. We're grateful that you have made a way for us to come to you, not in our own name, but in the name of another. And that's on the basis of Christ's person and work that we ask you now to bless our time. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to see wondrous truths in your word? Would you help us worship? My goal for us not to leave with a new piece of advice. My goal is to leave with fresh worship. So Holy Spirit, would you make that happen? Would you help us taste anew the privileges of the gospel and the beauty of Christ and the power and sovereignty of God? We want to walk out here with white hot passions for such a majestic God. So help me communicate that, please. Help us respond faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Four pictures of God's power. Number one, he created all things. He created all things. Jeremiah 32, uh, 17. Ah, Lord, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. In fact, we could say that nothing is hard at all for God. It's not like God has to strive and struggle. Uh, he didn't create the universe in six days because he just he could only get so much in 24 hours. He didn't need a nap. He didn't take a rest. He didn't need a Red Bull. Okay, he did that to illustrate the work week of an Israelite, most likely. All right, he could have created. He didn't need six days. He could have just said and had it all be done. He chose not to, but he creates all things. He doesn't have to strive. He doesn't consume energy. He doesn't. He doesn't need a timeout. He just does. He just does. Let there be light. And there was. Right? I love how he makes the stars. Verse 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. That is, the stars. He creates, listen, he created the stars with his breath. I want us to think about this. Can we just talk for just one second about this? This is a picture of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is our galaxy. It's where we live. Okay? It's the, where our solar system is located. And the biggest and only proper, properly speaking, star in our solar system is called the sun. It's a main sequence star. Burns at about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface and about 30 million degrees at the center. Uh, it travels through the galaxy at about 670,000 degrees miles per hour, and contains over a hundred billion stars, many of which are bigger than it. The Milky Way is a small galaxy compared to the millions of other galaxies in the universe, some of which are 150 times bigger than the Milky Way, and total, in total are filled with quadrillions of stars quadrillions of stars that God made, and how did he do it? He breathed. And there they were. He created all things, which leads to number two. He sustains all things. He sustains all things. I used to be in a theology group with a guy. We were talking about creation. And he believed that God kind of wound up creation and just kind of let it work that he was sovereign over it all, but he kind of wound it up and just let it run, that he wasn't actively causing the grass to grow or actively causing people's hair to grow or fall out for that matter, that he just kind of wound the whole thing up and just let it run. And I disagree. Hebrews 1.3 says it this way. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe. Not upheld, not created. He upholds, that is currently, the universe by the word of his power. In fact, Paul goes so far to say in Acts 17 that in him we live and move, and have our being. At each and every moment, God is actively sustaining everything in creation, from the sun that shines, to the hair on your head, to the fly that lands on your head in a presidential debate. God is sustaining all things, and science can help us see this. Okay, our solar system in general, and our earth in particular, are only able to exist within natural forces tuned to unimaginably precise life-permitting ranges. Let me tell you what I mean. Gravity, for example, like the force of gravity. Too much gravity, we die. 
too little gravity, we die. Um, Jay Richards of the Discovery Institute in Seattle gives this great illustration. He says, imagine a ruler stretching across the size of the known universe, which is 15 billion light years. Okay? So you travel at the speed of light, and you do it for 15 billion years. That's the ruler we're talking about, just an inch ruler. And then set the amount of gravity that we have right at the center, one of those inches. Now, you got me? Huge ruler, set the perfect amount of gravity we have here for life-permitting circumstances right in the middle. He says this, quote, If we increased the strength of gravity by just one part in 10 to the 34th power, the equivalent of moving less than one inch on the universe-long ruler, the universe couldn't have life-sustaining planets. That's the whole universe. 15 billion light years, if it moves less than one inch, no life. That's what we want to ask to the unbeliever in this room today. Is the best explanation for that gravitational constant remaining in that range, is it chance? Stephen Hawking said this in his work, Brief History of Time. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the, the development of life. Well, I think he's right, even though he wasn't a theist. He would say they seem to, I would say they are. They are finely adjusted by God. Every single, and upheld by God, every single morning you wake up, and our universe has not imploded or exploded. It is because an omnipotent God is upholding it by the word of his power. He is omnipotent. He creates all things. He sustains all things. Number three, he needs nothing. He needs nothing. Now, I'm cheating a little bit here because this is actually a different attribute than omnipotence. It's called divine aseity. And it's not important that you know that. But I'm throwing it in here because it helps us see how big God is. It helps us think about his power. Acts 17, 24 and 25, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Simply put, our God does not have needs. He, 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 was, he wasn't created, doesn't have a birthday. He's eternally existent. He doesn't consume resources. He doesn't need energy. He doesn't need help. And he does not need you or me. He does not need you or me. In fact, someone asked me a couple weeks ago, I was at a PhD seminar, and I just finished a presentation on the praise of man, some of the material I actually preached on here at New Century the week before. And he asked a follow-up question to my presentation, because you kind of have like firing squad style. You give your presentation, and everyone like fires back. And he asked the question, Chase, I know that we shouldn't seek the praise of man, but does God need the praise of man? Does God need our worship? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. God does not need our praise or our worship. A.W. Tozer says it this way, Were all human beings suddenly to become blind, still the sun would shine by day and the stars by night. For these owe nothing to the millions who benefit from their light. So were every man on earth to become atheist, it would not affect God in any way. He is what he is in himself without regard to any other. To believe in him adds nothing to his perfections. To doubt him takes nothing away. Our God does not need our church's praises. God does not need our prayers. He does not need our songs. He does not need our worship. We do. We don't find our value in the fact that God needs us, but in the fact that in his gracious, gracious initiative, he has rescued us and allowed us to participate in his mission to redeem the world. That's amazing. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our praise. If a, if a bomb dropped on New Century, and I hope it never would, and everyone perished, the gospel would go on without a beat. That is, without missing a beat. God doesn't need our church. But we need him, and we're grateful that he's included us in his initiative to rescue the world, which depends on truth number four. And it's this, that he conquers death and disease. That he conquers death and disease. 
Over and over again in the New Testament, Jesus is doing miracles to show that he is the author of life, as he's called in Acts 3. He's the author of life. He has the power of life itself. One of my favorite examples is in John chapter 11, where Jesus raises one of his friends from the dead. His name is Lazarus. And actually, if you read the story, you learn that he actually lets Lazarus die. He gets word that he's sick, and he stays three days, lets him die, so that he can display his power and raise this dude from the dead, which is exactly what he does. He walks up to the tomb, and we read this. Uh, Let's see. Here we go. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him, and let him go. At his word... Death to life. Come out, Lazarus. The church father, Augustine, was using a little bit of sanctified imagination, just thinking about the power of Jesus. And he, he is reported to have just guessed. It kind of said this. It's not in the Bible. This was his imagination. If Jesus hadn't specified Lazarus when he said, come out, all the dead of the earth would have risen to life. That's our God omnipotent, powerful God. And of course, Lazarus' being raised to life was just a preview of the kind of power displayed in Jesus' resurrection. I stumbled across an interesting question this week as I was studying, and someone asked the question, who raised Jesus from the dead? Now, initially, I, hadn't, I didn't give it much thought, and I was like, God the Father or God? That was my answer, and both, which are both correct, by the way. But it's also incomplete. If you read closer in the New Testament, you will find that it credits each member of the Trinity with raising Jesus from the dead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John 2, 19. Uh, sorry, 1 Peter 3. He was put to death in the body, but made, made alive by the Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit raising Jesus from the dead. And then Jesus also claims that he has authority to raise himself from the dead. John 2, 19 and 21. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. John 10, 18 says this. No, Jesus says, no one takes it, that is my life, from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the entire Godhead at work to raise Jesus from the dead. Which is really good news because the God, entire Godhead will be at work to raise you. From the dead. The entire God had a triune God ensuring that for you, cancer doesn't have the last word. That death and disease don't have the last word. The entire God had making sure that coronavirus doesn't have the last word in your life. The entire God had working to make sure that we will not spend eternity floating around as disembodied spirits playing harps and petting animals. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to have physical resurrected bodies, imperishable. And the physical resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits is the guarantee that you're next. It's going to happen to you too. He was first, man, you're next. Because our God has defeated the grave and put death to death. It's no wonder the psalmist says, let the heavens declare your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who and the heavens can be compared to the Lord. Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones. And awesome above all who are around him. This is our omnipotent, all-powerful God. We see four pictures of his power in creation of all things. Sustaining all things. Not needing anything. And conquering death and disease. So This is his power. This is the Lord Almighty. And what does he do with that power? He reigns. He reigns. He takes that kind of incomprehensible control and power, and he reigns over every square inch of the universe. And that's the second part we're going to talk about today, his sovereignty. Omnipotence and sovereignty go together. He's all-powerful, and he's all-sovereign. I'm going to give you four pictures of what that reign looks like, just like we did for omnipotence. Four pictures flowing out of this established fact of God's omnipotence, four pictures of God's sovereignty. He's powerful. I want to show you how he uses that power in his reign over his creation. Number one, he is sovereign over nations. 
He is sovereign over nations. Psalm 33, 10 and 11. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. It doesn't matter what some cabinet, some parliament, some senate, what decision they make. That there's not a single decision, not a single health care plan, tax plan, immigration policy that will thwart God's plans for this nation, or any other nation for that matter. Does that mean that everything a nation does is good? Absolutely not. It means that any action taken by a nation or government will be thwarted if it is not consistent with God's sovereign will because only his plans stand forever. Only his. No one else's. His plans stand forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. I like just think for one moment just about this particular country and our current political climate. This is true for every country, by the way, but I want us to think about ours for just one moment. Is it not immeasurably comfortable from what you see on your Facebook, what you see on TV, measurably comfortable, comforting to know that when you, lie, you can lie your head down on the pillow and know that the plans of God's heart for the United States of America will stand. The plans of God's heart for the United States of America will stand. And every other country, by the way. Okay? It's not American favoritism. Every other country. But just think about that. You need to know that. There's not going to be some candidate that's going to ruin that, no matter what happens. You say, well, what if we elect the wrong president? What if we elect a bad ruler? Doesn't that mean God's hands are sort of tied and this whole thing, this thing's just going downhill outside of God's sovereignty? Absolutely not, because we have a verse in the Bible that tells us that God is sovereign over individual rulers. Here it is. This may give you some of the most peace of anything today. Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. He turns the king's heart, the president's heart, the dictator's heart, the prime minister's heart, wherever he will. Which means at the end of the day, November 3rd, whether it's Trump or Biden, their personal wills in that Oval Office are ultimately subject and subordinate to God's sovereign will. That should give you peace. This doesn't mean, let me be clear, this does not mean that God will produce the kind of country that you long for. That's not what this means. It means that no political agenda will evade his control as he prepares you for a better country. No political agenda will evade his control as he prepares you for a better country. Hebrews 13, 14, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Can we just memorize that real quick? I think this is really important. We've never, I don't know if I've ever done this. We're going to memorize a verse on the fly. Okay, let's say it together once, look, looking at it, and then you don't look at it. Here we go. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Hebrews 13, 14. Okay, now say it without looking. Here we go. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Man, I hope you hold that close to your heart. There is a better country that we're living for. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says it this way. I must take care, on the one hand, never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other, never to mistake them for the something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find until after death. I must must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country, and to help others to do the same. Why? Because here we have no lasting city. But we seek the city that is to come. Next, he is sovereign over salvation. Number two, he's sovereign over salvation. This is so immeasurably comforting for me from Paul in Ephesians 1, verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Notice this is before the foundation of the world. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Look at verse 11. 
In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things. All things, not some things, all things according to the counsel of his will. This should lead us to worship. Anyone who is being honest about how sinful and fallen you are should be shocked to learn that God would see everything about you and set his affection on you. It's the opposite of what we get in our culture. Well, of course he would. Of course he would say, but there is no of course about it. It's amazing that he would save a wretch like me. That he would adopt you. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should have never chosen him. And I am sure that he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for some reasons unknown to me for I never could find in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. So I am forced to accept that great biblical doctrine. This, of course, is not just election, but it's bringing us to faith. God draws us. He gives us eyes to see. Like he opens Lydia's heart. He creates repentance and faith. And then it's still not done. He, he has to sustain that faith. Only those, you have to endure to the end, right? You gotta, he sustains that faith by the Holy Spirit. And then he raises up our bodies on the final day. He's Lord over, uh, he's Lord over predestination. He's Lord over the effectual calling, regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. He gets credit from beginning to end so that he can get the glory for it. No one will sing about in heaven about what you did. Everyone will sing about the grace of God to us in Christ and saving us every step of the way. That's exactly how he planned it. He is sovereign over salvation, which then leads to this. He is sovereign over your life circumstances. Number three, he's sovereign over your life circumstances. We read in Ephesians 1.11 that he's sovereign over everything. The counsel of his um, the counsel of his will works everything according to the counsel of his will. And, you know, some people ask me sometimes, we talk about um, sovereignty. Um, they think, Chase, I think sometimes you get a little bit carried away when it comes to this whole sovereignty thing. Um, and I just, I want to put my cards on the table. Okay, some of us, I think everyone, if I just did a survey in this room, said, is God sovereign? I think everyone would say, yes. But how sovereign? Is God just sovereign over big things? Is he just like sovereign over my job? Or is he sovereign over my parking spot? I'm serious. Is God's sovereignty like a fishbowl where he just kind of sets up boundaries and anything that happens inside is kind of, or is he really controlling everything? And I just want to say, I do believe that God, before the foundation of the world, determined that I would wear a green Under Armour shirt today to church. I believe that. And some people say, well, Chase, again, I think that's where you're, I believe in God's sovereignty, but I think you're taking this thing a little too far, and I disagree. And here's why. Verse Proverbs uh, Proverbs 16, 33 says this, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Every roll of the dice in Las Vegas its final decision is from the Lord. The most, here, here, here's the takeaway, the most insignificant, random things in your life are still happening under the sovereign control of God. You play Monopoly tonight with your family, God will ultimately be in control of whether you get Park Place. That's how it works. Sovereignly reigning over every part of his creation. Dutch Reformed theologian Abraham Kuyper said it this way, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Everything under God's sovereignty. Reality is there are people in this room right now who are in a unique season of struggle and pain. Financial trouble, family trouble, marriage trouble, Health, it's a very unique season of life for so many people, for all of us, in one way or another. And you need to know that those frustrations and those pains are all coming under the sovereignty of God, and they are all being worked out for God's glory and your good. This is where we truly can claim Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of those who are called according to God's purpose. All things. God is sovereign over even the slightest things 
in your life. Nothing out of his control, which then leads us to the final thing. He is sovereign over sin and evil. God is sovereign over sin and evil. This is where we're going to stop today. We said God's sovereign over everything. You can't let him off the hook every time something bad happens. That was Satan. It's popular to hear that good things come only from God and bad things come only from Satan. It's not true. It's not true. Bad things do come from Satan. Let me be clear. But not only from Satan. God doesn't need to be let off the hook for everything that's going on in the world. You don't have to make excuses for him. Lamentations 3, 37 and 38 say this, Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? You remember the story of Joseph? You remember that one? If you, if you don't, I'll narrate it. Guy, guy uh, you know, gets a pretty cool souvenir from his dad. His brothers are jealous for a variety of reasons. They sell the guy into slavery. They sell their own brother into slavery. Put him down in a well, right? Some people come by, all right? Uh, he gets sold into Egyptian slavery, and then he's working in this guy's house named Potiphar. His wife falsely accuses him of trying to make a sexual advance, so he gets thrown in jail, Okay, and then he has an opportunity to get out, but then the king forgets about him, so he stays in jail. Eventually, he gets out of jail, and he becomes he, you know, second powerful in the king, second most powerful in the kingdom. His brothers come, and he recognizes them. You know what he says to them? He says this to his brothers who sold him into slavery. Don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Of course, he says famously in Genesis 50, 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And we may see that and we say, yeah, I get that. He was able to see how it kind of worked out. A lot of people were saved and he helped out with the famine. Um, but we still might question God for using evil like this to accomplish his purposes. Like, yeah, we see how it worked here, but the Holocaust? Are you kidding me? Where was God there? Slavery? Does that come under the working all things for his glory? I mean, what do we say about those things? Is God in control over those things? The answer is yes. It's important that you understand why we can give a yes there. We don't say God works evil for good because we can always see how it works out. Because we often can't see how it works out. Some things see horrifically, see horrifically pointless. They seem just, there's no explanation. So we don't say this because we can observe like, oh, I see how it all worked. Now it's all worth it. That's not what we say. The reason we can know that every act of evil is under God's control is because the most horrific act of evil ever carried out was willed, orchestrated, and planned by God. The most horrific act of evil ever carried out was willed, orchestrated, and planned by God, and that is the brutal execution of God the Son. People say, well, the worst things are in the Old Testament. Not even close. The execution of Jesus of Nazareth, God the Son incarnate, is the most heinous evil that has ever happened. And it was willed by God. And it's because of his sovereignty, even in the worst evil, we can know he's sovereign over all other evils. It's because of his sovereignty in the worst, most heinous evil, that we can know he's so sovereign over all the rest. Let me just ask you this question. Who killed Jesus? It's a good question to ask. Who killed Jesus of Nazareth? There are multiple correct answers. You could say maybe uh, it was the Romans, the Jews, Pontius Pilate, Judas, you could say it was even two, two or three particular soldiers, three or four, however many were on the execution unit that day. 
And while all those people are morally responsible for Christ's death, they are not ultimately responsible for Christ's death. Who killed Jesus? We get our first glimpse in Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Did you hear that? It was the will of the Lord to crush him. The Lord has put him to grief. And this only becomes more clear when we get to the New Testament. That was just the preview. Acts 2, 23 and 24. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Right? Peter's Pentecost sermon. This Jesus delivered up to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified. Maybe it's most clear, though, in Acts 4. How about this? For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. That's like everyone I just mentioned. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They were gathered together in this city against your holy servant, Jesus to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Friends, God ultimately killed Jesus, crushed Jesus, so that you and I could go free. The good news of the gospel is that we are saved from God, by God. For God. I'll say it again. The good news of the gospel is that we are saved from God, his wrath, by God, for God. He is orchestrating all things, even the execution of his own son, for his glory and our good. He is completely sovereign over sin and evil, whether it's your sin or the sin of others or Satan that would seek to hurt and ruin you. All of it, whether it's Roman soldiers at a cross, whether it's a twisted business partner or a corrupt politician, all of it bows to the sovereign will of God as he holds you in the palm of his hand. And all of it. And because of this, it means that not only do we stand at the mercy of God to protect us from evil, we stand before the holiness of God having to give an account for our evil. We stand before this omnipotent, sovereign God having to give an account. And guess what? Everyone's guilty. Everyone's guilty. And there are really only two ways to fix this problem. There are really three in culture. One is to try to run from God by being bad, like the prodigal son. The other way is, is actually try to, to, to get to God by being good. Y'all heard this one? People, you try harder and you read the Bible more and help the poor people and say your prayers and that God will look upon your religious devotion and effort and reward you with salvation. But the person who's running from God by being bad and trying to get to God by being good, they are both as lost. They are equally as lost. Because trying to get to God by being good is sin. It's a works-based righteousness. We need, listen, we need the work of another. We need someone else to do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. Listen, I don't care what our culture says. You can't rescue yourself from your brokenness and sin. You can't put yourself back together. You can't put together a good enough life to stand before God and, and win his approval. You can't. You've fallen short. Read Romans 3. And the good news is that you don't have to. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth came and he served as our substitute. He absorbed the wrath of God due to your sin. And he offers his perfect record of righteousness to you when you repent and believe. 
so that when you stand before your God, it, when you stand before God, it's not on the basis of your works, but on the basis of His. You're coming in someone else's name, coming in the, in someone else's um, record, getting credit for someone else's performance. That's what you need. It's foolish to think that you would stand before the omnipotent, all-sovereign God and say, well, I, I got a little better. I've made progress. We are saved by grace alone, not in future improvement, but through the definitive act of Christ, dying, rising, and saving us, giving us His righteousness the moment we repent and believe. So that for all eternity, we could say with the angels and the heavenly hosts, hallelujah, the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this opportunity to just examine your sovereignty, your omnipotence. God, I just want to taste how powerful you are. We, we talk about these things. I want it to just go further from my head to my heart. I want to sense it. I want to be overwhelmed by it. I praise you for being so magnificently powerful that you could create quadrillions of stars, millions of galaxies by breathing. You don't need rest. You don't need help. You don't need me. I'm so grateful you don't need me. You'd be out of luck, God. I'm so grateful that you need absolutely nothing. You are self-existent and self-sustaining. I praise you that you orchestrate every single thing that's going on in our lives right now, whether it's the roll of the dice, whether it's who's in the Oval Office. God, I pray that we would gather immeasurable comfort from that power and that sovereignty exercised every moment of every day. We're so grateful that nothing will thwart the plans of your heart. Nothing. So hold us in your hand. Help us rest in you as we wait for that better country. As we cling to the hope that here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is above. Help us be faithful to claim that promise and live like it's actually true. In Jesus' name. Church, if, if you please stand, we're going to continue worshiping this morning.
Let us pray together. Father God, Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you for your omnipotence, Lord, for your sovereignty. God, it is so comforting to know that no matter what happens in our circumstances, with our family, with our country, in this world, God, that you are in control of all of it. What a relief that is, God. Lord, we are just amazed, Lord, that you created every star in the universe, Lord, and yet you want so desperately to be with us, God. It is just amazing that that you gave your son to die on the cross, Lord, so that you we, so that we may be reconciled to you, God. Lord, you don't need us for anything, but God, we need you. Lord, we need to, you created us to worship God. We need to worship you. Lord, we just pray this morning for more of you, more of your presence in our lives, God, so that we may just, so that we may participate in your redemptive story, God, for man, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. Let it be to your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Church, please be seated. Tag at the end there. Whoo! That was great. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate your service to us. Again, also want to just thank our visual team. Um, thank you guys over there for just serving us each week. Also, I want to thank, is there anyone here? I don't, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but if you're a part of our cleaning team, would you stand? If you're, if, is there anyone here who's a part of our cleaning team? Would you stand? All right. Round of applause for our cleaning team. Thank you. You may be seated. Guys, these are our unsung heroes. This, this uh, sanctuary doesn't clean itself. Now, we have people who come in and donate their time to do that. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I know there are some watching at home, thank you. Thank you so much. By the way, if that's an area where you'd like to serve, we're always looking for people to add to the rotation. So you can come see me about that if that's something you're interested in. This is normally the time of the service we pass our plates. We don't do that. Uh, we may not do that. You know, this is where it's working out pretty well. So uh, if you would make sure to give your offering at roanokechurch.com slash give. Okay, we give generously. We don't, we're, not, we're unapologetic for this. We're not ashamed to ask for that. Okay, we give generously what God has given to us. You can do that on roanokechurch.com slash give. There's also a box out in the lobby. You can drop that offering. Um, but real quick, I, uh, before I give just two brief announcements and dismiss us, I want us to go over our memory verse. So don't put it on the screen. But we memorized a verse during our sermon, and I want us to say it together. It's Hebrews 13, 14, and it goes like this. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. That was weak. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. Here we go. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Amen. I hope you hide that in your heart. A few announcements real quick. This, this evening at 6 o'clock, we have a members meeting, Life 127. It's not a business meeting. We're going to talk about God's faithfulness uh, to our church in a variety of ways. I hope you'll join us. It'll probably be a little shorter than normal, probably about an hour. We had a, a few things that um, people can't come, that they were going to be a part of it. So probably about an hour from 6 to 7. So I hope you're there. Um, we will be receiving a, a new member, and we would be receiving three new members, but for t two of them had to, had to bow out for just uh, not out of being members, but just this one, they were out of town. And, want to have a health problem. So I look forward to that, though. We'll have uh, put, some, put some folks in the membership. Also, we've got an event coming up, uh, the Chili, oh, Week of Prayer. I'm out of order, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> the Chili Prayer Week. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, we do have the Week of Prayer November 9th. I hope you're there at 6 a.m. I know it's early. Uh, Muslims get up to pray at 5. We can do 6, okay? Seriously, we can. So um, let's do it, and let's just, a lot of people say that this is the most powerful prayer time they've ever experienced, because many people have never spent this long in prayer. It's not random prayer, it's guided prayer. There's things on the walls, there's stations, and once you finish your prayer, you move to the next one, and then you leave. Okay, there's no like check-in or check-out or anything. Okay, So I hope you're there. We start out with a few hymns, a cappella, love it, one of my favorite parts, then we release people to, to pray. Uh, you don't pray out loud, just to yourself. So I hope you'll join us for that. And then... The chili cook-off. Okay, here we go. We're having a chili cook-off. We thought this would be awesome because I love chili. Not because I love chili. All the elders, we thought about this, and the elders' wives like, we love chili. So we'll have a chili cook-off. Let's have a competition. More details coming on what the prize is going to be. Um, we're also open, and we, this isn't a you know, necessity, we're also open to letting someone in our church run the chili cook-off. Like, if you're like, oh, that's a cool thing. I'd love to, like, head that up. 
That's fine. We'll do it if no one else does. That's fine too. But we just we thought about a few people. I'm not going to call any names. I'm tempted to, but who would be really good at putting together a chili cook-off? Okay, so if that's something that you'd be interested in, let us know. Put it in the comment card uh, in your bulletin, and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch if you'd be interested uh, helping right there. And I think that's uh, oh, we got fall back. Don't forget. Okay, we're falling back. Daylight saving time coming up. Look, next week we'll be back uh, talking about more attributes of God. I hope this is helpful for you. Hope, hopefully it helps you worship. Um, it certainly does. Um, I mean, I, I certainly do. I love thinking about God's power and his sovereignty. Let me just say a final word. We've got a group traveling back today who's been on a mission trip in uh, Bear Branch, Kentucky uh, at Big Creek Missions. And so we're grateful. For a, lot, a lot of those folks are normally here. They're not here. There's a pretty big chunk of folks who are traveling right now. And so um, we just want to remember them and their safety and continue to ask the Lord to bless the seeds that they've sown this week as they serve. So let me send us out by uh, speaking a word of God or the people of God. If you would stand uh, for the benediction, starting in Psalm 67, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his cause his face to shine upon you that his ways may be known among all the nations, nations and to the ends of the earth as you live, not for a city here, but for the city that is to come, to the glory of Jesus. Amen. Love you, church. Go in peace. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will Surely come find us like blazing wildfire, singing your name, God.